Did God use evolution to create? Does this idea bridge the gap between science and faith? Stay tuned to find the answers. Well, hello. Welcome to Creation Magazine. This is a program that gives Christians the kind of faith-building information you can find in Creation Magazine. And what we want to do today is see if evolutionary theory and a plain reading of the Bible, whether it's compatible or not. That's right. Many Christians try to harmonize uh, the evolutionary story with, uh, with the Bible in, right. in some way. And uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Theistic evolution is what that's called. Right. And so we're going to talk about, is that possible? Is it even possible to harmonize the two without doing damage to one or the other? It would seem that for me, and I know you speak for the ministry too, and I've spoken to the, some of the other speakers, that many of the Christians we meet as we're going around and speaking um, seem to have tried to do that, have tried to mix uh, you know, evolutionary concepts or, or the theory of evolution um, with, with the Bible. And uh, while there's nothing in the Bible that explicitly states you can't be an evolutionist and be a, a Christian, um, what we're going to look at today is whether you can be a consistent Christian, whether, right. whether these beliefs are consistent, can you harmonize them? Um, I always like to ask people, well, you know, they say, well, could you believe God could have used evolution? I like to ask them, well, which God are you talking about? Are you talking about the God of the Bible? And that's really what we want to do today is look at the Bible to see if we can interpret that or not. That certainly makes a difference. Can evolution be harmonized with the Bible? Right. And so we'll look at that on, on the show today. Many have said that creationism is religion based on faith and evolution is science based on facts. However, the word religion has been defined as a set of beliefs concerning the cause, nature, and purpose of the universe. The theory of evolution is exactly that. Evolution is a belief about what happened in the unobservable past. It is a belief about what caused the universe to come into existence. It goes even further by commenting on purpose or morality as admitted in an interview with evolutionist Richard Dawkins. The interviewer asks, There's a large group of people who simply are uncomfortable with accepting evolution because it leads to what they perceive as a moral vacuum. Dawkins responds, all I can say is, that's just tough. We have to face up to the truth. Evolution clearly fits the definition of religion. Creation Ministries International staff, many from a wide variety of scientific disciplines, have produced thousands of articles now available in a massive online database. www.creationontheweb.org has grown to become the world's most powerful internet resource on the creation evolution issue. There are more than 5,000 articles already online and new articles are added daily. Some of the topics covered include the feasibility of Noah's Ark and the evidence for a global flood, the age of the earth from both the Bible and science, scientific arguments against the Big Bang and models that explain observations in astronomy within a young earth time frame recent discoveries that support dinosaurs fitting with biblical history, and many, many more topics. These thousands of articles are available for free 24 hours a day to anyone on earth with an internet connection. One of the main reasons that CMI built this website is to strengthen the faith of Christians. Genesis is one of the most attacked areas of the Bible. Creationontheweb.org provides logical, scientifically accurate counterattacks in this area. As 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 says, We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. Got questions? Get answers at creationontheweb.org. Some Christians believe that evolution should not be taught in public schools. 
Creation Ministries isn't against the teaching of evolution. However, it should be taught warts and all. That is, not only the evidence for it, but the growing evidence against it. Currently, evidence against evolution is censored so that students hear only the case for it. Proverbs 18.17 says, The one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. When evolution is taught along with all of its scientific problems, many people reject it. Any scientific theory should be able to withstand close and honest scrutiny, but evolutionists lobby hard to keep any evidence against evolution out of the classroom. Well, today we're talking about whether um, you can be a consistent Christian and marry the theory of evolution into what we read about in the Bible. Is it, is it compatible to say that, well, maybe God used evolution to, uh, to do his creating and that uh, maybe, maybe the book of Genesis is just kind of like a, an, an analogy to, to uh, you know, evolution and, and so on and so forth. Um, I come across this quite a bit while I'm out speaking for the ministry and uh, talking to people and I always remind them that there's only three big questions in life, right? There's, where do we come from? What hap you know, what's the meaning of your life? And what happens when you die? And, of course, CMI focuses on question number one. Where do we come from? And you really only have two options. Either the universe created itself or it didn't. Either God created or, or there's an evolutionary process. Um, I, I, I find it hard to understand why a lot of Christians want to marry together the two concepts because really... Um, question number one can be answered with either form, God created or evolution. You, don't, you, you only need one, you don't need two. So um, really as you look into the, the matter, it seems to me that many Christians, they just think there's so much overwhelming evidence for evolution and they don't want to give up their faith, um, they, they just try to blend the two together. Well that's the issue, isn't it? <coughs> this notion of evolution, it, it's, it's in the media, it's all around us, millions of years mm -hmm. and so on, we, we hear it through so many different avenues. And uh, there's, there's folks out there, well-meaning Christians, like you said, you don't want to give up your faith, and yet all these people are saying evolution millions of years, so let's just blend the two and be, and be done with it. Right. And, and we'll be happy. Yeah. But so we wanna, what we want to look at uh, on this show is, is that possible? Mm -hmm. it, it's certainly possible with, uh, with other religions. Evolution fits in very nicely with many other religions. Right. Is it possible with Christianity? Right. That's the question we want to answer. So what you'd kind of need to do, I guess, is, is because we're talking about creation or the beginning, you'd have to kind of look at what you know, evolution says, uh, what, what processes um, evolutionary theory come up with, and then comparing to what the Bible says and see if that's compatible. Uh, we're going to look at whether uh, God's character uh, is reflected you know, in the theory of evolution and, and those processes and right. those type of things. But you know, when you think about what um, evolutionists say, you know, how the cosmos formed, what well, was the Big Bang? You know, 16 billion years ago, nothing blew up and created everything, or <laughs> right. something yeah, to do well, with that. Big Bang for you, right? right? And uh, and somehow, it, you know, that explosion created, you know, as as things coalesced and cooled down, and and, and all that kind of created planets, suns, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, the Earth itself. You know, um, evolutionary geology would say that the Earth uh, was a hot molten blob that cooled down, and over millions of years, you know, now we're a planet covered in 70 percent water, and that always intrigued me. But anyway, <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's the way that's supposed to happen. The plants and animals, um, you know, they, they were supposed to be, there was supposed to be no life, and then non-living chemicals somehow came together, formed the first life form, and, you know, onward, upward, and created all the diversity we see today. And then you look at uh, man, well, we're just the end product of evolution. We're the, uh, it's the pinnacle of evolution on the planet, and, and yeah, so the on and so forth. the result of all that activity. So the question is really, can that story, can mm -hmm. the evolutionary story that you just described in brief, can that be made to fit with the Genesis account? Right. Or even, I guess that's not even the question, can, can it just be made to fit with Christianity? Right. Never mind the Genesis account. Maybe the Genesis account is just a spiritual story embodying some moral truth about the, the fall from a perfect world and paradise and so on. And, right. and these kinds of ideas are floating around out there. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, most Christians will not look at the New Testament 
and say, well, this is just an analogy, like Christ's birth and his death and his resurrection. and, and, and that's, they, they don't just say, well, that's just an analogy. E even though it's written as historical, and Genesis is written as historical, they will somehow say, well, maybe we can, we can change our ideas. I mean, you know, if you look at the Bible, what it says about what we just talked about, it doesn't talk about a big bang. It talks about God no. creating um, from nothing. Right? There's, there's nothing God creates. He creates time, He creates energy, He creates matter, He does all that kind of stuff. It says that the earth comes first, covered in water. Right? right. And That's then a different sequence than evolution. S different sequence. Sun, moon, and stars came, and then the earth, according to evolution. And right. And at first there was, there was, like you said, a hot molten blob, mm -hmm. and then water came after that. Right. That's, That's, the, evolutionary That's story. the evolutionary story. The Bible says that the earth created first, covered in water. And day four, the sun's created. Now, even we're, we're going to talk in a later show about could those days have been millions of years and all that kind of stuff. But even if they were, you've still got a, a sequence. It's, it's out of sequence. You've got the sun on day four and you've got the earth on, on day one. The Bible says that God created all the plants and animals and, and, and things to reproduce after their own kind. Evolution doesn't say that. It says that things evolve and change into different things over time. Right. Um, so already here we've got some hints that evolution, what evolution says about history, the history of the earth, for example, yep. doesn't fit with what Genesis is saying, what the right. Bible is saying. Yeah, it contradicts it. And, uh, and then people, of course, you know, created in the image of God. Let us make man in our image. Right. Well, evolution says that we came from, you know, ape-like creatures. Else. So, you know, did God use apes and then form them into our, his image? Or, you know, you start getting a lot of questions. You get people saying, well, was that, were Adam and Eve ape-like creatures? And then they evolved and then they were the first people. You know, you get all sorts of uh, kind of things. But we see things that are out of sequence. We see, see things that don't look the same, at least in, in, in the two stories. Um, so there's some severe challenges to, uh, to biblical theology. And even the way you interpret scripture all across the board when you, when you start off trying to, to put these two things together. Right. So if we look at some of these scripture references uh, that we have here, Matthew 19, 4 to 6, haven't you read, this is, this is um, uh, Jesus talking mm -hmm. about marriage, haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh? Mm-hmm. And there's that, there, it's going back to a real historical genesis. Jesus is using this as the basis for marriage. Right. Right? The very first marriage was Adam and Eve. It wasn't, it wasn't an ape man and an ape woman <laughs> who sought out an ape pastor and then, and then got <laughs> married. Uh, it, was, it was Adam and Eve. That's right. the, so, so the, like, as, as you alluded, at, alluded to at the beginning, the meaning of anything is tied to its origin. Mm -hmm. Our worldview is tied to our view of origins. Right. The meaning of marriage, for example, in this case, Matthew 19, is tied to where it came from. Right. Is it, is it one man for one woman for life? Mm -hmm. Or could it be a man and a man, or a woman and a woman? I, isn't it interesting, the first three words, haven't you read? I mean, to me, that's very powerful. This is Jesus quoting from Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2, and he's saying, haven't you read? Well, what's he saying there? The scripture is the authority. He's saying, well, haven't you read? You want to know the answer to this question? Go to Scripture. And what it plainly that's right. says, that's, that's what I take away. That's the takeaway point because otherwise, if, if this is just an analogy, why would he be saying that? Yes. He, he was saying, you know, haven't you read? Uh, it is written. You know, you, you hear this over and over and over again in, in Scripture. Right. So, yeah, obviously. He's, he's relating this, Jesus is relating this to a real flesh and blood marriages happening today, mm -hmm. just as Adam and Eve were real flesh and blood people back in history, exactly. back in Genesis. Exactly. Well, let's take a look at another Scripture there. It's 1 Corinthians 15, 21 to 22, and then verse 45. It says, For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Then 45 it says, So it is written, the first man, the first man Adam became a living being, the last Adam a life-giving spirit. I mean, this is clear reference of, of where death and, and sin comes from and how you know, Adam was a real person. And, and, and that's how sin and corruption entered and why Jesus came as the last Adam. Right, I mean that connection between Jesus' resurrection, it was a real physical resurrection. 
just like uh, Adam Adam was a real physical person. Mm -hmm. uh, if it was just all spiritual, if Adam was just spiritual, well, well what sense does a spiritual resurrection make? Right. Paul, Paul's it, talking about the gospel message it's here. Not, it's, a, it's a foundation of Christianity. Right. And it connects back to a real Adam. That's that's the connection being made here in 1 Corinthians right. 15. Right. If, if, if Adam was just an ape man or an ape person or an analogy, then is Jesus an analogy too? Because he actually says the first man, Adam, and then the, you know, the last Adam, Jesus Christ. Right. Here in 1 John, Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Again, here, John is talking about a real person, Cain. Right. It's not, an, it's, it's not a type. It's not allegorical. Don't be like Cain. Cain is a real person. Mm-hmm. And one more. 1 Corinthians 11, 8, 9. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Uh, Paul actually says the sequence, I mean, this, this is his teaching in this area. His sequence is important. The sequence of creation is important. That's right. Here's just one more. In the last days, scoffers will come. They will say, where is this coming that he promised? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on since it, since, as it has since the beginning of creation. In Genesis chapter 2, the order of creation seems to be different to that in chapter 1, with the plants being created after Adam. Does the Bible contradict itself here? A close look at the original language reveals that the plants mentioned in chapter 2 verse 5 refers to cultivated plants only, not all plants. The point being made is that in the world before the curse, before the appearance of thorns and thistles, no one was needed to cultivate plants. Another thing to keep in mind is that Genesis 2 is not a chronological account like chapter 1. It focuses mostly on the details of day 6. When the Bible appears to contradict itself, careful study always reveals that the Bible is free of contradiction. It really is the Word of God. Finding answers to questions about the origins debate. Creation or evolution? When the results are in, which one is supported by scientific observations? Find out at creationontheweb.org. Creation scientists and researchers from around the world have contributed more than 5,000 articles, many of which appeared in leading creationist publications like Creation Magazine and the Journal of Creation over more than 30 years. A new daily front page article keeps web visitors informed about the latest breaking news in the creation evolution debate. When news breaks about the latest evolutionary ape man, or some major supposed evidence for evolution, check out creationontheweb.org for a Christian creationist response. Each weekend, the website features a feedback article, a response to web visitors' email feedback. Often, the anti-creationist arguments in skeptics' emails are refuted in a detailed response by a CMI staff member. So in a very practical way, believers can see that the Bible, and particularly Genesis, can be defended against skeptics' arguments. The website includes an online store where you can browse through hundreds of the world's leading creationist books, DVDs, and related materials, all available to build up the faith of the believer. Got questions? Get answers at creationontheweb.org. Jesus and the Apostles took Genesis as real history. We've talked about some of the Bible verses there that, that uh, uh, Paul and John and, and Jesus as well, uh, we record that, that's recorded there in the Bible, their view of Genesis, their view of those historical events that we see in Genesis. They believed it as real history. That's right. Now, what's interesting is the humanists have made the link between this literal Genesis and or literal interpretation or plain reading of Genesis and how um, with their interpretation of the history of the world evolution and, and these, these things they're not compatible and, and they often bring that up uh, as, as ways of trying to debunk Christianity saying well it's plain reading that this is the way it is but it's not the way it is. So the evolutionists, the humanists know that you can't marry evolution and, and Genesis. That's right. As a matter okay. of fact I've got some quotes here from the leading humanist of Darwin's day 
uh, Thomas Huxley lived right. from 1825 to 1895. Now this, this gentleman knew his scripture very, very well, as many of the humanists of the day they did. Uh, for example, Charles Lyell, we mentioned in previous shows, the father of uh, you know, modern uh, geology. He said he wanted to free science from Moses. I mean, he knew his Bible well and he knew how to argue and so on right. and so forth. So I'll just read you some, uh, some of the quotes from, uh, from uh, Thomas Huxley. In his essay, Lights of the Church and Science, Huxley states, now, it's, it's written a little while ago, so the, the, the English is a little old, but uh, anyway, you'll get the gist. He says, I'm fairly at a loss to comprehend how anyone for a moment can doubt that Christian theology must stand or fall with the historical trustworthiness of the Jewish scriptures. The very conception of the Messiah or Christ is inextricably interwoven with Jewish history. The identification of Jesus of Nazareth with the, that Messiah rests upon the interpretation of the passages of the Hebrew Scriptures which have no evidential value unless they possess the historical character assigned to them. He knew. You, you, you can't get rid of the historicity of it. history. Right. Yeah. He says, I, can, I confess I soon lose my way when I try to follow those who walk delicately among types and allegories, a certain passion for clearness forces me to ask bluntly whether the writer men, means to say that Jesus did not believe the stories in question or that he did. When Jesus spoke as a matter of fact that the flood came and destroyed them all, did he believe that the deluge took, really took place or not? And he says, moreover, I venture to ask what sort of value as an illustration of God's methods of dealing with sin has an account of an event that has never happened. If no flood swept the careless people away, how is the warning of, or more worth than the cry of wolf when there's no wolf? He, he's saying, you know, as soon as you, you say that there's millions of years, then you've got to say that, well, the fossil record didn't get laid down by the flood. That was laid down over millions of years. So now what do you do with the flood? Was right. it a universal, you know, global deluge, a flood? And when Jesus refers to that, did he really believe it was a global flood or did he not? And so he's starting to, to unwind and unravel the historicity right. here. And he mentions there, I mean, there's, there's a judgment coming that obviously he read about in the New Testament. Right. The, the, the apostles are talking about a coming judgment. They relate that to the judgment back in Noah's time. And he's pointing it out. And rightly so. If the judgment in Noah's time was not real, that's right. then what do you do with the judgment that's supposedly coming? Exactly. He continues on and he says, If divine authority is not here claimed for the 24th verse of the second chapter of Genesis, What's the value of language? And again, I ask, if one may play fast and loose with the story of the fall as a type or an allegory, what becomes of the foundation of Pauline theology? He had it figured out. Good point, yeah. Yeah, you know, and, and so here's a humanist, someone who doesn't accept scripture, but he's log arguing very logically. I mean, most people would, would uh, I see that as a very logical statement. It, it, it makes sense. Yeah, sure. that's right. You, you can't have this as, a, as an allegory or, or something like that. So it's important to recognize the fact that the humanists are using these arguments against Christians and many people are buying into that. And he's writing that at the time of Darwin, criticizing those Christians attempting to marry evolution and the Bible. That's right. And he's pointing out the errors in theology that will creep in. That's right. Now, we mentioned on a, on a show before that, you know, um, some figures state that up to 70% of kids that grow up in Christian homes that are educated in the public school system um, will walk away from the Christian faith and, and not come back. 70%, by the time they're 18, will walk away from the Christian faith. Now, that's in the Western, and I mean, Western you, world. You've talked to some uh, youth leaders recently, and the figures in some denominations are closer to 85%. That's correct. 85%. I, I mean, I can't imagine being a youth pastor. You know, just 85% of your target audience is going to walk out the door. Right. And uh, I, I terribly demoralizing. That's how I served at, at, at my church as, as the, uh, the youth pastor, and it is. And, and you see what's happening, though. They're getting taught a, a, a story of history that so contradicts what the Bible says. And, of course, humanists of the day are using these arguments, too, and they're throwing them up in classrooms saying, Look at this, it's inconsistent. You, how can you believe this part of the Bible if you, if you don't believe this part of the Bible? Right. And so on and so forth. And of course, uh, I think you've got a good example of someone that uh, has tried to marry uh, these two things right. together yeah, and found out it didn't work. A very public example, <laughs> Charles Templeton. And we wrote about this in Creation Magazine a number of years back. 
Uh, so the details are there in the magazine again. Creation magazine, uh, 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 Charles Templeton, a uh, very popular evangelist at mm -hmm. the time of Billy Graham. At one time he was more popular than Billy Graham. He and Billy Graham did, did tours, yeah. uh, crusades through Europe. And uh, uh, very, very popular. Here he is in Fredericton, New Brunswick, in November 15, 1953. You can see the, the crowds of people there. Uh, that's uh, the east coast of Canada. And he was instrumental in Canada in starting Youth for Christ. Uh, here he is with Billy Graham in the early 50s. Um, uh, but if, if, if you've heard the name Charles Templeton, as many people have, I mean, thousands of people went to his church in Toronto. Mm -hmm. uh, thousands of people have made decisions to, uh, to, to follow Christ, have become Christians mm -hmm. as a result of going to, his, uh, to, to, to listen to him preach. Right. But if you know the name Charles Templeton, chances are you also know that a number of years ago he wrote this book, Farewell to God. And uh, the subtitle, My Reasons for Rejecting the Christian Faith. Mm -hmm. What happened? Here's a very public example of somebody that we, we would, would think, well, here, here's, a, here's a Christian man. Wow, look at, look at everything he's doing. And this is the equivalent today of, of hearing that Billy Graham just came up with a new book saying, Farewell to God. Right. That's the right. equivalent That's the equivalent impact. today. So what does he say in his book? Look, look at this. Why does God's grand design require a creature with teeth designed to crush spines or rend flesh, claws fashioned to seize and tear, venom to paralyze, mouths to suck blood, coils to constrict and smother, even expandable jaws so that prey may be swallowed whole and alive? He continues, nature is, in Tennyson's vivid phrase, red in tooth and claw, and life is a carnival of blood. So what happened? Right. <laughs> here's, here's this evangelist. Well, what happened was uh, the, the Billy Graham and the other folks there associated with the Crusades at that time recognized that he didn't have the theological training. Right. Uh, and apparently in, in some, in some uh, times he'd, he'd go through an entire crusade not mentioning a single Bible verse. <laughs> so they thought, okay, well, we're going to send you to Princeton, get, right. a, get a theology degree, send you to Princeton. Mm -hmm. Princeton at that point had started, this is the 50s, had already started teaching evolution. They started blending evolution right. in with their theology classes. In Templeton's book, he says this to Billy Graham, but Billy, it's simply not possible any longer to believe, for instance, the biblical account of creation. The world wasn't created over a period of days, a few thousand years ago. It has evolved over millions of years. Right. And he ends his book on this sad note. He says, I believe that there is no supreme being with human attributes, no God in the biblical sense, but that life is the result of timeless evolutionary forces having reached its present transient state over millions of years. Right. So here we've got you know, a, a sad tale of what, what you would think is that here is a great Christian man doing, doing great Christian things, right. you'd think, but he went off the rails in Genesis. Right. Jesus was not his problem. In fact, there's, there's records of people going to him just before he died. He died a number of years ago. He had Alzheimer's and so on. And, and he said to one of these, these folks, he said, I miss Jesus. Mm. I miss Jesus. That's right. And Jesus was not Templeton's problem. Genesis was Templeton's problem. Right. He saw the world that we live in today, the cursed world, the evolutionary world, if you want to think of it that way, might makes right, survival the fittest, mm -hmm. the strong wiping out the weak, and so on. He saw that as the world that God created. It's been right. around for millions of years, he says in his book. Right, and it contradicted what, he, what the plain reading of Scripture was, and he was a consistent and intelligent person. To, and this, we this have is to what, give him that. He was consistent. Right, and, and, and this is what you know, I, I often find, is that you find people who are consistent and intelligent, and they really do want answers to things, and when they start looking at this, they, they see, okay, there's some inconsistencies here. And being a consistent person, I want answers and I want to know how right. this works together. Many people who, who try to marry evolution and the Bible, they, they do so, but it's an inconsistent position. Templeton was consistent and it caused him to reject the rest of the Bible. Right. It's a consistent position. So there are some of the dangers of blending evolutionary ideas with what the Bible says about history. Young Earth creationists are sometimes accused of believing that the whole Bible should be taken literally. What we actually encourage is that the biblical text should be taken according to the style of writing, that is, taken straightforwardly. The Bible contains poetry, parables, prophecy, apolliptical writing, and historical narrative. Each writing style should be taken as it is written. For example, we should not twist the parables of Jesus to suggest that they refer to real people or events. 
Since Genesis was clearly written as historical narrative, to understand it straightforwardly means taking it as a literal historical record of what actually happened. Creation, Evolution, The Controversy A powerful illustrated creation message from Dr. Carl Wieland that all Christians need to hear and share with their non-Christian friends. See how the evidence of the real world fits with the history recorded in Genesis. Understand how evolution, long ages, undermines the message of the cross. Discover the real answer to racial reconciliation. This DVD considers whether the idea that God used evolution to create is compatible with Christianity. Dr. Wieland, Managing Director of CMI Australia and Editor of Creation Magazine, is an internationally known speaker and author on the accuracy and the authority of the scriptures. In this DVD, he reveals how the Bible provides us with answers to those perplexing but common questions and how to use that knowledge to help share the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the In the News section, where we get to go and uh, see what uh, people are saying about these issues that we discuss. What's going on out in the world? Yeah, right. There's a lot, apparently. Anyway, I came across this article, and it was entitled, Theistic Evolution, The Fallacy of the Middle Ground. Now, uh, basically, it's a long article, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but you can get the idea from the title, what they're talking about. So the Fallacy of the Middle Ground. Written by a Christian ground. or a non-Christian? Non-Christian. Non-Christian. So, um, but but they they've got it titled perfectly: theistic evolution. Did God use evolution to you know create and, and biology and all that kind of stuff? And the fallacy of the middle ground. Apparently, the, as you read through, basically they're saying there is no middle ground. That you you can't have one or the other. But anyway, I'll just read from some of it. Um, it says science is not just a collection of facts and theories; it's a way of knowing. We may not be able to describe an exact scientific method that everyone can agree on, but there are some fundamental principles that all scientists adhere to when they're doing science. I wouldn't agree with that statement, but anyway. One of these principles is called methodological naturalism. And uh, here's the basic idea behind uh, methodological materialism as described by Eugenie Scott of the National Center for Science Education. There's a quote from Eugenie Scott. She said in 1999, Science is a way of knowing about the natural world, as practiced in the 20th and likely in the 21st century. Science restricts itself to explaining the natural world using natural causes. This restri restriction of evolution to explanation through natural causes is referred to as methodological nat materialism. Materialism in this context referring to matter, energy, and their interaction. Methodological materialism is one of the main differences between science and religion. Religion may use natural explanations for worldly phenomena, but reserves the right to explain through divine intervention. Science has no such option. Whether or not miracles do occur, they cannot be part of the scientific explanation. Now, that's, those are bold statements, but I would not consider them to be accurate. I mean, at what point in history did science get hijacked so that if, if you have any kind of explanation that isn't based on methodological naturalism, that everything is natural, that you can explain everything by matter and, right. and, and energy, at what point in time did that become fact and that, that did that become where every true scientist, I, I mean, those are the restrictions they're supposed to be under. Basically what she's advocating is a type of censorship where you, you're not allowed for, science is unallowed to conclude that God may have created that the Bible might be true. Right. Be, that, 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 that would be outside of the realm of science. So you censor all of those possible outcomes and the only outcomes that are allowed in your scientific experimentation to discover how things work, where they came from and so on, is naturalism. It and can only be natural. And when I was in school growing up, you know, not coming from a Christian home, every explanation I ever had for the natural world was presented to me in an evolutionary uh, way. No wonder, I mean, I know I'm a, you know, a sin-filled person as much as the next person, but no wonder I came to these conclusions because that's all I ever got taught. If you never even get exposed to the other side, how are you supposed to have a fair and balanced uh, idea of, of, of things like this? Right. Um, one of the quotes, they have many quotes in the article, and one of the quotes by Edward Wilson says, I'm not going to be one of those scientists who keeps waffling and saying, oh well, science has its role, religion has its role, science has its own kind of truth, and religion has its own kind of truth. 
somehow as we work more and more, they will uh, somehow come together. He says, I don't believe that for a minute. I don't think that Darwin would have believed it. What he's just saying is, you know, you, you can try to waffle and we can all try to hug and get along and it's all going to be okay and you can believe in evolution. But he's just saying, you know what, no. There, there's a specific reason for that. They have an answer to question number one. Right. Where did we come from? And right. you don't need multiple answers to that um, to, to, to satisfy yourself. Yes. I love this article. It was, it was from Creation Magazine, September 2000, and you can see it on the website. Mm. Do a search on the horse and the tractor. That's at, at uh, creationontheweb.org. Yeah. And I'll just, I'll just read this article by John Wood a uh, wonderful creation researcher. Once upon a time, a salesman met a farmer contentedly using a horse-drawn plow. The salesman, referring to the just-invented diesel tractor, said, I'm here to tell you about a machine that will knock your socks off. After learning about how the tractor worked, the farmer remarked, so the tractor is the new means by which the horse pulls the plow, right? Not at all, said the salesman. The tractor does not work with the horse. The tractor replaces the horse. The salesman then explained to the farmer how the tractor is self-propelling and simply does not require a horse. I see now, mused the farmer. Still, I can combine the horse and the tractor by placing the tractor in neutral and then letting the horse pull it and the plow as well. Wait a minute, said the salesman. That doesn't make sense. Why have the horse pull the tractor and the plow? If you're going to use the tractor, let it run on its own power. If you want to use the horse, however, let it plow by itself. Don't make the poor animal pull a heavy machine for no reason. In that case, the farmer replied, I'll drive the tractor and then just use the horse for recreation. But whenever I drive my tractor, I will tell everyone that it's really my horse that's pulling it. <laughs> Shaking his head in bewilderment, the salesman replied, you can say whatever you want that makes you comfortable, but remember, the tractor is self-propelled. The horse has nothing to do with it. Oh, but you're wrong, said the farmer with conviction. Just because we can't see the horse anywhere around the tractor doesn't mean that the horse isn't there anyway, pulling invisibly. <laughs> The salesman sighed and put on his coat. Yeah, right, he muttered, heading for the door. I can't get through to you. The horse has only an imaginary presence in the propulsion and operation of the tractor. In fact, sir, there's absolutely no difference, other than you're saying so, between the tractor running by itself and the tractor being pulled by an invisible horse. And off he went to look for other customers. Here's the moral of the story. The folly of combining a horse and tractor is equivalent to combi combining God and evolution in the so-called theistic evolution. A naturalistic evolutionary explanation for the origin of life, for instance, doesn't need God acting to move things along. God, like the horse, is quite irrelevant. If the tractor is working properly, the horse can wander in the pasture. Likewise, imagining God working through naturalistic evolution is as nonsensical as having a horse pulling the tractor in neutral. If naturalistic evolution is truly a sufficient explanation, it will run on its own power. Mm -hmm. That is, account for what we observe solely in terms of natural forces and entities. We may wish to envision, envisage other roles for God, if we still see a need for them, but creating living things isn't one of them. Right. On the other hand, if evolution isn't sufficient, in other words, if the tractor doesn't work, then why hitch God to the explanation? Why encumber God the Creator by asking Him to pull a false, not to mention cruel and wasteful evolutionary process? Oddest of all, however, is retaining the nominal or strictly rhetorical role of God in the process that has no need of Him. The farmer who claims that despite all appearances, the tractor runs because his horse is invisibly pulling it isn't going to win the confidence of his neighbors. <laughs> and so it's, it's just a fun little story. I, I really like it. From, from yeah. the moment I read it there, there uh, seven years ago now, um, it, it, it just illustrates the, the, it makes the, point. the nonsensical idea yeah. of joining God with evolution. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense, and it's not consistent with the scriptures and Christian theology. Was there rain before the flood? Genesis 2 says only that there was no rain when Adam was created on day 6. It doesn't rule out rain during the entire time before the flood. What about the covenant of the rainbow God made with Noah after the flood? Doesn't that prove there weren't rainbows before the flood? God frequently gave existing things new meanings. For example, bread and wine already existed, 
but were given specific significance at the Lord's Supper. There's a lot more information in the Arguments Creationists Shouldn't Use section at creationontheweb.org. Did God Use Evolution? Drawing from a variety of topics, biology, biblical chronology, and the origin of the human language, and showing the relation to one another in answering this question, author Werner Gitt reveals that evolution is not only bad science, it also violates scripture. Written for the layman, but with a scientific slant, this compelling book devastates Darwinian arguments for the origin of our universe and planet. Dr. Gitt, an information specialist based in Germany, is the author of numerous books and a popular lecturer throughout the world. He helps Christians answer attacks on their faith by addressing the common questions asked by skeptics. In this book, 20 objections against theistic evolution are discussed and the consequences of theistic evolution are presented as 10 dangers to our understanding of the true nature of God, the gospel, and what the Bible teaches. Well, when you're talking about the um, idea that God maybe somehow used uh, evolution as a, as a way of he, that, that he created and that the uh, Genesis story perhaps, you know, it's just an analogy or something like that, really one of the, the, the main things you have to contend with is whether the, uh, the character of who we read about in the Bible is, uh, matches evolutionary theory and the processes that are involved in that and, and stuff like that. I mean, you really have to look into... Um, you know, God, God says he creates, and at the end his creation is very good. Now, I, w I would say that most Christians, even those that believe in uh, evolution or, you know, millions of years, things like that, believe that God's a good God, and, and so we, we get to say, okay, well, what is good then? Right. Right? Now, if, if you look at Scripture and you do take uh, Genesis um, as, as history, it actually says that in the beginning, uh, everything ate, like all the animals and, and, and people, ate plants. That's right there in Genesis 1, uh, 29, 29 30. That's and 30, right. that everything ate plants. There was no uh, you know, people eating animals and animals killing each other and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's recorded as happening after sin entered into the world. Right, in Genesis 3, then perhaps animals started eating other animals and so on. And right. Bad things entered the world at that point. And, and God doesn't even give us the permission to eat meat until after the flood. Right. That's, that's, that's recorded there. So, you know, as you're looking at that and you're looking at uh, Scripture in Revelation where God will restore the world to the way it was, uh, the curse is going to be done away with and death will actually be done away with and he's going to, you know, restore it. It's like, like the computer sitting here. If it, you know, the program gets corrupted and I hit system restore, it returns it to its original uncorrupted state. Yeah, we you hope, know anyway. something about that, right? Yeah, I, yeah, I know a lot about that with my technology. But um, so, you know, really what does it mean when we, we talks about God being good? Um, there's a quote here from Acts 10, 38. It says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Okay, all right. Most people, even non-Christians, would probably know some of the good things that Jesus was supposed to have done, right? He, he healed people. Right, they had sicknesses, and he yeah. healed them, blindness, the lame, leprosy, blind, even brought them back from the dead. Lazarus, brought, yeah, brought them back to life. Um, you know, he he calmed the storm, so like natural disaster, he he calmed that down. Um, you know, he, the the New Testament talks about feeding the poor, and and of course one of you know Jesus' miracles was we fed the people and stuff like that. So we can kind of get a very clear idea of what good means from the Bible. Right now. To say, you know, what does evolution say uh, about death and suffering and stuff like that? It actually says that those are natural things, right? Yes, Carl Sagan here, um, a, a good description of evolution. The secrets of evolution, he says, are time and death. Time for the slow accumulations of favorable mutations and death to make room for new species. So, so that's an integral part then of the evolutionary process. The se those are the secrets of evolution. Those right. are the main driving forces, time and death. So if you've got God, Jesus Christ, the Creator, comes as the Savior, and He then fixes all these death, heals people, uh, you know, calms natural disasters and things like that, basically He created a world with all that in it. Then He's promising that He's going to restore it to its original state, and He goes around 
fixing those things and saying how good he is, it starts to be a very it, puzzling. It doesn't work, does it? No. If evolution is a story of death over millions of years, then Jesus comes and, and he does good things that are the to, opposite of evolution. It, 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 it doesn't fit. You, you get into a mess. And what's he going to restore it to would be the, the real question. How would we even know the difference if, if it's just going to be more millions of years of you know, and is he going to take another 16 billion years to recreate the Earth, or, or I think we just got updated, didn't we? Isn't it 18 billion years? It's some, yeah. The universe, the age of the universe has just changed. And, and I'm sure else. that will go up be, before I, I spend my time on this Earth. The universe will get older. It seems to be what it does. So, it starts becoming very, very inconsistent. As a matter of fact, uh, there was a, uh, a theistic evolutionist at one time interviewing Jacques Manon, and uh, he, he was a a very prominent evolutionist, and uh, he actually asked him about that. Is it possible that God um, used evolution to create, right? Right, and here you can see that his response, this is the response from, uh, from Mr. Minot, selection is the blindest and most cruel way of evolving new species and more and more complex and refined organisms. Mm -hmm. I am surprised that a Christian would defend the idea that this is the process that God more or less set up in order to have evolution. Right. Is that, that just blows me away because here's an atheist, he understands what evolution is saying. It's right. a blind, cruel way to evolve ever, ever higher creatures. Mm -hmm. It involves the extinction of billions and billions of unfit varieties of animals right. so that the fittest can, can survive. It, right. it, it, if God used that, here's an atheist saying that... He's showing the inconsistencies. He's showing the inconsistencies. How could God use this, this, this loving God that we read about in the Bible, mm -hmm. we've just mentioned some references, why would God use such a cruel and wasteful process? Right. Now, I've had people say to me, well, we still see those things. We still see death and bloodshed and carnivory. So are you saying, you know, if you're saying God is a God of love, why is that here? Well, the biblical account says that God created a world in which it was perfect, and he's going to restore it to that world which it's perfect, but man blew it. And we've, you know, we're the ones that allowed sin and the corruption to enter into the world. And so really, if we've got a problem with what's going on, we need to take a look at the mirror. I mean, so many people, they blame God, right? Like in 2001, when the, uh, 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 when the terrorists flew the airplanes into the, into the Twin Towers. Yep. And um, you know, people were blaming God back then. God, right. why did you let this happen? Right. But wait a minute, you know, we live in a sin-cursed world where those types of things are normal. Right. A couple of years after that, there was the tsunami around Christmas time, a couple mm -hmm. days after Christmas. That killed, what, 230,000 people? Yeah. Once a little, little earthquake, earth movement underneath the ocean, that's and right. it caused this, this massive destruction. In the very good world, Genesis 131, at the completion of creation, God calls his creation very good. In that world, those that things would not have happened. Wouldn't have happened. So because of man's sin, you know, God cursed the, the world. He said, oh, you want to do it by yourself? Good. He withdrew some of his sustaining power, said, we, oh, you, you get to make your own decisions. And of course, that's why terrorist attacks and, and, and those things happen. And the world isn't the world that he created in the beginning. But people are looking at it and saying, oh, this must be the world God created. Therefore, maybe evolution is the way God, God used. That was Templeton's problem. Right, we talked about Charles Templeton. He said, well, look at the world around us. There's all these evil things, claws fashioned to seize and tear, venom to paralyze, mouths to suck blood. He saw all these bad things, which we see, and they're, they're all here. It's not mm -hmm. a very nice world. And then he said, that's the world that God created? Wait, wait a minute. And, and he, he, he saw a problem. Yeah. Of course, evolution, all this evolutionary information, he was obviously overcome by that. And no one explained to him the real biblical history. Right. Initially, in the world that God called very good, these things were not here. There were no animals with claws fashioned to seize and tear, venom to paralyze, mouths to suck blood, and everything else that he listed in his book there. Right. Um, but nobody explained that to him. What a shame. I, I keep thinking that if, if someone had gone to Templeton in, in those, those, those latter years of his life mm. and explained to him, you, you've your view of history, biblical history, is wrong. Right. You're, you're trying to blend it with evolution, and that's why you're running into all these problems. That's mm -hmm. why you see God as this terrible ogre who's saying all these things are very good, all these, these, these vicious features we see in animals and, and the evil that we see that man does to man and right. so on. 
And if somebody would have explained to the, him to that, it, it, explained that to him, yeah. would that have made a difference in his life? That real history from Genesis. Yeah, I, I think it would have. You referred to uh, to him being interviewed before he died. It was actually Lee Strobel, and uh, you know he he talked to, to Templeton, and and you, you said. He said, I miss Jesus. That was the last thing in the right. interview. He said, you know, Jesus was the, the, the best person that had ever lived. Of course, he didn't believe he was God anymore and, and stuff. But uh, he, he said all, the, all his, you know, the, the best things he's ever seen in life all came from the teachings of Jesus. And then he said, I miss him. But um, he recognized the goodness of Jesus Christ. Yes. Right? Right. But he got taught a different history, so he didn't recognize Christ as the creator anymore. Because being taught millions of years and, and, and evolution and, and all these things dying and killing each other and all that kind of stuff, he, he thought God the Creator was an ogre, but Jesus Christ recognized in the good things, he didn't see the good things in the Creator anymore. But because of those links, going back from Genesis, that's where Christianity and the Gospel message started. Right. Because he went off the rails back in Genesis, he was forced, in a sense, to be, to be intellectually consistent. He was forced to also throw out Jesus. Right. Many people have been told that creation and evolution is compatible, but if those concepts can be blended together, then our meanings of words and the ability to understand scripture are actually meaningless. Biological life's enormous complexity is a serious objection to atheistic evolutionary theory. Many evolutionists recognize the serious scientific problems associated with the origin of the first cell non-living chemicals. In an effort to avoid the obvious that an all-knowing God created life, some people think that perhaps aliens from other planets were somehow involved in seeding our planet with the building blocks for life millions of years ago. But in this scenario, the problem for the evolutionary story of life still remains. It has just been moved to another planet. The truth is, there is no intelligent life on other planets. God created life fully functioning right at the very start. Alien Intrusion has a lot more information on aliens and the creation evolution issue. Finding answers to questions about the origins debate. Creation or evolution? When the results are in, which one is supported by scientific observations? Find out at creationontheweb.org. Creation scientists and researchers from around the world have contributed more than 5,000 articles, many of which appeared in leading creationist publications like Creation Magazine and the Journal of Creation over more than 30 years. A new daily front page article keeps web visitors informed about the latest breaking news in the creation evolution debate. When news breaks about the latest evolutionary ape man or some major supposed evidence for evolution, check out creationontheweb.org for a Christian creationist response. Each weekend the website features a feedback article, a response to web visitors email feedback. Often. The anti-creationist arguments in skeptics' emails are refuted in a detailed response by a CMI staff member. So in a very practical way, believers can see that the Bible, and particularly Genesis, can be defended against skeptics' arguments. The website includes an online store where you can browse through hundreds of the world's leading creationist books, DVDs, and related materials, all available to build up the faith of the believer. Got questions? Get answers at Creation on the Web. Org. Well, here we are at the feedback segment, and uh, it's always great to get um, people emailing uh, questions and comments into the ministry. Uh, some of them are uh, positive, some of them are not so positive, but we try to respond to everyone who will just follow our feedback rules as outlined on the on the website. Uh, we really do want to hear from uh, people from various positions and, and try to explain uh, why we believe what we believe. That's right. I mean, there, there's, there's a whole lot of information. There's over, over 5,000 articles now on the website right. that answer the 
the, the great, great, great majority of questions are answered. Yeah. But occasionally there's folks there that still want some additional detail and so on, and that's why we provide for that feedback section. Right. But most of those questions are answered. Now, now the first um, feedback I'm going to talk about actually is um, uh, it, it's kind of typical because it, it indicates someone that hasn't perhaps gone through our website and really looked into um, the answers because uh, right. uh, the, the article was entitled, Why Wouldn't God Use Evolution? Well, as you can imagine, there's um, many uh, articles uh, pertaining to that on our website, but this was uh, someone who uh, perhaps just looked at the website very casually, saw what we're all about, and just moved on. Really encourage people, go to the website, uh, creationontheweb.org, upper right hand corner get answers you can uh, hit, hit a button and you can have access to over 5,000 articles almost 5,000 articles on our website now pertaining to this issue what about right. the dinosaurs all that, all that kind of stuff and of course theistic evolution there's a section there that deals specifically with the issue that we've been talking about exactly today. in this feedback the person was saying you know why wouldn't God use evolution you know evolution isn't evil and and, and, and these sorts of things. It makes sense to him. Uh, God could have used billions of years instead of six alert days. And it, just general things that we've talked about. But my comment would be, you know, biblical illiteracy among Christians, and, and I can't just generalize everywhere, but as I go around to church after church and, and, and speak at many different places, I'm noticing a trend. I'm noticing people aren't knowing their Bible as well as right. they, perhaps they should. And we had that quote from, <clears throat> from Thomas Huxley there uh, uh, back in Darwin's time. He's, he's, not even a, he's not even a Bible believer. But he knew what it said. he knew his scripture so well. He knew the scripture so well. That's right. He knew it well enough to argue against it. And so the point being here is, you know, we've just, I'm not going to get into, you know, is, is evolution evil and all that kind of thing. We, we sort of spent, spent some time doing that. But really, you know, if you know your Bible well, if you know the character of God, you know who He is, you know what the Bible says, you know what it says consistently from beginning to end, you have the, you know, the, the overarching themes of the Bible in your mind, that God will restore it to the way it was in the beginning and it was yes. good in the beginning. God's goodness. God's goodness, His grace, um, why Jesus had to come, what right. He had to pay the penalty for. If you understand all those big, big pictures, um, I don't see how you can marry the two concepts together. I think it's just a... a, a, a a matter of fact that people have accepted millions of years, have accepted evolution, and, uh, and want to blend the it two together. It doesn't work. We've, we've given examples, like a very public example, like Charles Templeton. Yes. Uh, where he, he uh, I mean, it, it completely threw him off the rails. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he, he looked at Genesis and tried to blend evolu or the evolutionary world that we see around us, or the, the, the world of death and bloodshed and suffering and survival of the fittest that we do see, uh, and he tried to blend that with Christianity. It doesn't work. That's right. We've got another, uh, another feedback here. Why do you take the Bible literally? Uh, interesting uh, feedback. This is from M in the, in the USA. He says, I found that the people of this organization interpret the Bible in a very literal way. How do you deal with the many paradoxes contained within the words of the Bible if you take all of its words literally? How do you interpret them? That's, the, that's a summary of, of what right. he wrote in anyways. Uh, and the response was, here I'll just read some of the response by, uh, by one of our staff. You incorrectly state that we take the Bible literally, which we don't. That was one of the comments made here in response to this. We, and we, we've said this a number of times already. We don't take the Bible literally. We're, we're getting away from that terminology because so many people think when you take it literally, it means, well, you, you, you mean that the, the trees of the field literally clap their hands? <laughs> well, 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 no. If, if you take it in a literal way, it means you take it as it's written. Right. You, you so don't it's interpret poetic, it to be something else. Right. I don't read, yes. read Song of Songs and, and, and think that my wife's teeth are sheep, you know, dancing in a meadow or, or those, those types of things. It's yes. poetic. Um, um, yes. Okay. We'll just Song move of on. Songs. And that's, <laughs> interesting. That's definitely, uh, uh, need, and you, you need to understand certain things about the Song of Songs. Right. It, it's not uh, history and so on. Um, he goes on to say, and here's the response from, again from one of our staff, mm -hmm. the Bible gives us principles of interpretation in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 2 and Proverbs 8 verses 8 and 9. Now, here they are. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor, we do, nor do we distort the Word of God. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. That's 2 Corinthians 4 verse 2. So we're plainly reporting this. It's, right. it's, we're taking it plainly and so on. Setting the truth plainly before you. 
Here's the Proverbs uh, reference. All the utterance of, utterances of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing crooked or perverted in them. They are all straightforward to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. That's the Proverbs 8, 8 and 9. In other words, we are to read the, and understand the Bible in a plain and straightforward manner. Right. So we take that and that's how we understand the Bible. In all cases, you, you take it as it's written. It's a great time to be a Christian and there's so much that supports what the Bible says.